you doing today? Welcome to our First Timothy study as we continue through the book of First Timothy together. Today, we're going to begin talking about the qualifications for leaders. Uh, over the next couple of weeks, we're going to go through these qualifications and we're going to talk about them in a different capacity. You see, the thing about leadership is it follows us wherever we go. Without leadership, uh, whether it's in your family, whether it's in a local church, whether it's in the workplace, uh, things just fall apart. Things cannot function uh, as well as they do. Warren Wearsby uh, says that it must be organized, the organism must be organized or it will die. Leadership is a part of a spiritual organization. What a fantastic quote from him. And I want us to begin today with the first seven verses of chapter three. And we're going to talk about the qualifications for the pastor or the elder or the overseer in this context. So if you have your Bible, turn to 1 Timothy chapter 3 with me and let's look at this. It says, The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his household well with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for the God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he must not be puffed up with conceit and fall into condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into grace, into the snare of the devil. What I love about this passage of scripture is, A, that it applies to me. Uh, because whether we want to realize it or not, uh, leaders are qualified. You, you must be qualified a leader, a pastor uh, of the church. There's a calling that goes along with it. And as you look into this, anyone who aspires the office of overseer, or maybe it says bishop, or maybe it says pastor or elder, they held responsibilities. In fact, if you look, this word elder uh, is, is a great word. It means uh, presbutis, and it means that of an old man, that of a wisdomed man. And this is great for us as we look into uh, this qualification because it really is a noble task, but it is a task that you must be called into. Maybe you're watching, maybe you're listening and you're saying, well, I, I don't know if I'm truly called to ministry or not. Uh, I remember one of the greatest uh, pieces of advice, and this is one of those things that sounds absolutely crazy, but it's honestly true. If God has given you an ability and a calling to do anything else in the world, go do it. Uh, God did not give me any other uh, trades or tools or knowledge or anything. Uh, and when God called me into ministry, he made sure I knew that this was my career path. This was not just a job. This was not just a temporary thing that when God called me into ministry, it was for the long haul. And so it is a noble profession. It is not one to be entered into lightly. Listen, as we're going to talk about this later on, if you're getting into ministry because you think you're going to make a lot of money, uh, you're sadly mistaken. Most pastors don't make a whole lot of money. I know sometimes we see these great televangelists that make millions of dollars and they have nice cars and big houses. That is not the normal. Your local church pastor is going to be in a place in where you are uh, for <clears throat> this exact uh, thing. You're, gonna, you're, you're not going to be paid. Uh, your church should compensate you for a living wage, whether you're bivocational or full-time. But that's a completely separate issue. We're going to talk about the qualifications today. When you begin to compare these qualifications to, for example, in Titus chapter 1, you have more. You begin to quickly see uh, that there's a lot of similarities in the same office of the church is in view uh, in these. 
there was a as you look into the 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 early church there was a plurality of of elders and overseers that were taking care of the work involved as we're going to talk about this week and next week we're going to talk about the pastors and the 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 deaconess or deaconos uh in the greek and what's so important about these two functions is that they work together leadership is all about communicating and working effectively together uh, so often I hear of churches fighting amongst their deacons and their pastor. And honestly, when that happens, your ministry is hurt more than anything else. Now, I love my deacons. I have a great uh, board of deacons. They're absolutely phenomenal. I love them because I can go to them and they're brutally honest with me. And I can say, hey guys, this is something I'm thinking about. This is something I really want to try to implement in ministry. And I love that my chairman of the deacons specifically will be like, uh, Pastor, have you really thought about this from all angles? What about this or what about this? He's not antagonistic about it. He's not negative about it because oftentimes we'll do what I'm talking about. But he helps me to see ways that I haven't thought of. And that's exactly how the church functions. In leadership, these leaders of the church function together, whether you're a multi-staff church, whether you're a single staff church, you function together with the leadership that is given inside of your church for the greater kingdom-minded good. Uh, and that's great because that's when we get into these qualifications. These men have to be qualified. They have qualifications that are set out, that are laid out, and they must be given. Paul gives us 16 qualifications for a man to be expected as a pastor. These are 16 qualifications that a man must do. And as we look into these, as you get into these, we're going to walk through them one by one. The first thing that we see is that he must be above reproach or blameless. This word literally means that nothing can take hold upon him. That if you were to throw something at him, that it would just slide off. That nothing could be taken a hold of him. And that's just a qualification of a pastor because his witness is so detrimental to the church. Because if there's something in his life that, that Satan can use, he's going to use it. And especially when we get into later on, we talked about you must be in good standing. Uh, the unsaved, those that are looking at the church with criticisms, will find anything to bring him down. So he must be blameless. The second one that we have is that he must uh, uh, he must be a husband of one wife. He must be the husband of one wife. Now there are multiple interpretations of this verse. Uh, I'm going to look at the two most prevalent, and I'm going to uh, lay into what I think they they the, this means. The first and foremost is that a pastor must be the husband of one wife. As we look at this in the context of, uh, of the culture in this time, there was a large push, especially in the town of Corinth and Ephesus, uh, that a man would take his uh, wife's maidservant as his mistress. Uh, and so if the wife was getting older or uh, maybe, uh, for, for lack of a better terms, uh, maybe not as engaging, uh, in Corinth and Ephesus, there was this large push that was going and saying, well, you could take your maidservant, you could take your wife's maidservant as your mistress. Now, as we get into this, this talks about polygamy, this talks about a polyamorous relationship. This is, uh, this is specified multiple times in the Bible. This is no. And so if we look at it from this direction, the, in, in the, the, the way the Greek lays it out, uh, a, a one man uh, I'm sorry, a one-woman man. That's how it's laid out in Greek. He must be a one-woman man, which means that he's one woman, uh, which lays out pretty clearly you cannot have a mistress. And so uh, this, again, brings back this idea of adulterous relationships. This idea uh, goes back to a man that must be above reproach. The second way that we look at this is in through the lens of divorce. Divorce has become more and more common in our culture today. And so another way that this, is, uh, this passage is often translated uh, is that if a pastor is divorced, uh, he is not to remarry. 
uh, and that, uh, uh, in essence, disqualifies him from the office of pastorate. Uh, now, this is, an, uh, this is a very popular translation. This is a very popular way of looking at this. Uh, and honestly, this is something that I kind of uh, I struggle with because the Greek in this lays it out more in line with, I think, the, poly, uh, the polygamy, the polyamorous uh, relationship type thing. However, if you look at commentaries, if you look at the way people have interpreted this scripture, a lot of people tend to lean toward the divorce Thing. I'm a language man, and so of course I look more at how the language lays it out, uh, and so I'm tempted to go uh, back. I don't, I don't believe that a man should carry anything that could damage his witness into this, and so uh, uh, be weary, I would say, uh, of that man who uh, uh, treats relationships flippantly, uh, um, especially a marriage relationship, uh, but this idea that a man must be a one woman man. He cannot have mistress. He cannot have adulterers. He cannot have uh, extra polyamorous relationships in addition to his wife. Uh, and so this is, this is so dangerous because we see this so often uh, in our culture today where men are falling from grace. Uh, not, that's not really the right word. They're, they're falling uh, into sin because of adultery because of polyamorous relationships and so a man must be above reproach he must be the husband of one wife the next thing that we have is that he must be sober minded uh, he must be sober uh, minded and self-controlled respectable hospitable so as we look at this uh, first off this idea of sober minded we, we look at this into a way of vigilant he must be vigilant against his own mind intemperate is maybe a better translation of this temperate in all things um, we need to keep our heads in all types of situations uh, so often a pastor is, is, is given so much at once. There's so much that's piled on top of him. He needs to be able to keep his head. Uh, he also needs to remain sober. He must be serious uh, in his attitude and earnest about his hard work. Being a pastor is hard work. It is not easy. If you think that you're just going to be a pastor, you're going to work one day a week, maybe two days a week if you preach on Wednesdays and Sundays, and you're going to spend the rest of the time at the golf course, <laughs> You are fooling yourself. Uh, typically, I'll, and I'll tell you my schedule, uh, typically I spend uh, around 15 hours of study for a, for a Wednesday uh, message, uh, and then I spend between 20 to 30 hours in study uh, for a Sunday morning message. Uh, and this is just thinking, rewriting, moving, trying to figure out correlations, looking up uh, uh, historical texts, looking up things in this, uh, and it's a lot of work. On top of that, you will uh, be meeting throughout the week. This week I have several meetings, uh, and I'm meeting with certain people in the community. I'm engaging our community in different aspects. Uh, I'm also meeting with the baseball team. I'm speaking uh, to the baseball team. I also uh, have to take a couple of uh, our uh, church members to town. Uh, and shuffle them around. There's so much to being a pastor to do. Uh, and I remember uh, one Sunday, I remember talking about how I had learned a new skill. I had learned to be a lumberjack uh, and how to cut trees and chop wood simply for the fact that I had an elderly couple that needed that uh, and I had to provide for that need. And so you never know what your week is going to look like. And so it's definitely not easy. And so you must be vigilant and sober minded in that uh, work. Uh, you must be self-controlled or uh, orderly would be a good translation of this. You cannot uh, uh, be overzealous. You have to be organized in both your thinking and your living. There's so often, and, and with, to be honest, COVID has affected my brain in this, I have to schedule things out or else things fall through the cracks. I forget to do things. I forget a meeting or I forget to that I was supposed to take somebody to wherever. Uh, this is so much to do that things can fall through. And so you must be orderly. You must be of good behavior in that. You should have organized in your way. Uh, and this, this, this idea of modesty. This next thing is respectable and hospitable. 
You know, this literally means that loving of strangers. Uh, and, and this is an important ministry because especially you'll find that ministry, oftentimes, if you get to work in your hometown, you're very lucky. But oftentimes in ministry, you will be taken into places where you've never been or that you know almost nobody. Uh, and so everybody's a stranger to you. Uh, I have been at my current church for two years, and can I be honest, there's still people I don't know. And it bothers me when I walk into our local Mexican restaurant and I look around and I don't know a single person in that restaurant. That honestly bothers me uh, because I make it a point. I'm very community oriented and engaged uh, in our community, and so it bothers me that I still don't know people. Uh, but you must be hospitable. You must love strangers. Even today, when we look at this, a pastor and a, and a wife who are hospitable are able to create great fellowship within the, the, the midst of a local church. And so you must be hospitable. The next one is that you must be able to teach. You must be apt to teach. You know, teaching God's word is one of the main things reasons why some people get into ministry because they believe that they're good at it. Honestly, can I, can I, can I just be honest? I'm not good at it. Uh, I don't believe that my preaching is any better than anybody else's. I don't believe that my teaching uh, is honestly worth a candle spit. Uh, but I, I, I try and I try to improve each week. And I kind of, to be honest, have a little bit of an unhealthy obsession with bettering myself in this aspect uh, because I, I, I torture myself each and every single week. But this means that you must be apt to preach. Preaching is, teaching, I'm sorry, is one of the main uh, facets of a pastor's ministry. Many scholars believe uh, that as we talk about preachers and, and teachers in Ephesus 4, I'm sorry, in Ephesians chapter 4, uh, this role lies in one. This is why, pastor, you will be required to be a theologian. You will be required to be an author in some places. You will be required to be a teacher. You will be required to do all these things. And a pastor is automatically a teacher or a theologian. And you must be a careful student of God's Word. In, in all assets of, of knowing God and of teaching the Word, you must not be lazy in your study uh, because it shows in the pulpit. If you are lazy in your study, it shows in the pulpit. And that cannot be. Pastors must be uh, very studied. Now, can I tell you, that doesn't mean you have to be uh, an expert in everything. Uh, I have a few good men in my church that know way more about the Bible than I honestly do. You know why? Because they've had 30 more years of careful study than me. Uh, whereas I've tried my hardest to study and know all the ins and outs of God's Word, they have spent their entire lives combing each word, combing each letter. And so do not be lazy in your study, but utilize those in your churches that know the Word of God. Utilize them. Allow them opportunities to pour into you and to teach you uh, because honestly, you're going to be so blessed. The next one is to be not a drunkard or uh, not given to wine, as you might say. And the word uh, that describes this, this drunkard word, it, it describes a person who sits long with a cup. Uh, the longer that you would sit with a cup would be the more, I guess, intoxicated that you would be uh, in the Greek. And so this person sits long and drinks to excess. You know, sad to say, many of the members of the Corinthian church uh, were, were getting drunk as an act of worship into the Lord's Supper. They were attributing this, uh, this time of celebration with the Lord's Supper. Several years ago, I had the opportunity to attend an Episcopalian church, and uh, during the Lord's Supper, uh, they use real wine, and uh, they are very liberal with the application of the wine. And so uh, not knowing that it was real wine, I was uh, relatively young at the time and uh, really not apt to wine. I uh, got a little lightheaded from my dose at the Lord's Supper. Uh, this was a natural, this was a normal thing in the, in the, in the, the church of Corinth. You know, there's an old saying, 
what would Jesus do? And I know it's kind of corny, it's kind of cheesy, but honestly, what would Jesus do? You see, a godly pastor would want to set the best example of Jesus that he possibly can. And when you do something as a pastor that weakens your witness, it really is detrimental to your community. The next one that we see uh, is that he is not violent, but gentle. Uh, he is not one who is a striker, as the Greek word would say. Uh, he is not contentious. He's not looking uh, for a fight. Charles Spurgeon uh, would tell his college students, do not go about the world with your fists doubled up for fighting. Instead, carry your theological revolver in your trousers. <laughs> be ready to fight for the word of God, but do not be ready to quarrel with the word, which is very funny considering there were a lot of English American pastors in the Confederacy uh, that would love to have fought Charles Spurgeon because of his views uh, on slavery. And so a uh, little anecdote there. Uh, next is he is not one to uh, be guilty or the lover of money. As I said before, chances are you're not going to make a fortune in ministry. You're not going to make a killing in ministry. Statistically, you're going to live bivocationally. You're going to have to work another job. And, you know, I used to think that that was a disadvantage, but getting the opportunity to serve as a full-time pastor, it's, it, it, it gives me the opportunity to engage in my community, but I do not have a workplace that I can actively engage in. It's possible to make ministry an easy money maker if you uh, lose consciousness and integrity. Uh, but the reality is you must not be a lover of money because money becomes that idol in our lives and we need to make sure that that idol is Jesus. The next is he must be patient. He must be uh, gentle. Uh, this, uh, this gentle translation is, is a great translation because the pastor must learn to listen to people. Uh, he must be able to take criticism well. There are going to be people and Lord loves them and you're going to love them too, but they're going to, they're going to Monday morning come in your office and be like, pastor, that sermon yesterday didn't make a bit of sense. Uh, you missed them. You way missed the mark on that one. And there are going to be people that with the exact same sermon would be like, pastor, I needed to hear that this week. That was the best sermon I think you've ever preached. You're going to have to be patient with people because it's so difficult to deal with people sometimes, but you'll learn to love them and you ask God to, to, to give you patience for them because God will give you great patience for people. The next is he, he, he should not be a uh, quarrelsome or a brawler. He is to not be a troublemaker. He is to be a peacemaker. Uh, and this does not mean that you need to compromise on the convictions that God has given you through Scripture, but you have to learn to disagree without being disagreeable. And sometimes, can I be honest, that's really hard because short tempers uh, don't really make for long ministries. And as someone who has a short temper sometimes, I can attest to this, that God gives you great patience through it. The next is he must not be a coveter. He must not covet. Uh, you can covet many things. Can I be honest? You're going to find yourself coveting other churches in your town. You're going to find yourself coveting other churches within your denomination. You're going to find yourself coveting a lot. But you must learn to not allow yourself that opportunity. Because just because somebody looks like they have a large ministry does not mean that they are more successful than you. A measure of a man's success is not attributed to how many butts he's got in a pew on a Sunday morning, Pastor. Your success is that you stand, you open the Word of God faithfully, and you preach it. That is your measure of success. Oftentimes, we measure success with salvations and baptisms. But that's God's success. Your success lies that you preach the Word of God faithfully each and every single week. The next is he must manage his household well. He must have a godly family because this brings us back to what we talked about earlier. If a, if a pastor cannot manage his own household, if his household cannot obey and respect him, his church won't either. 
And that's a sad reality of what we face each and every single time we step in the pulpit. And can I be honest? This, this, this previous Sunday, my wife was in the floor wrestling our toddler who did not for the life of her want to sit down. And that was the first time I have been distracted uh, by a child in my preaching because it was my own. Uh, and, and, and I know this is hilarious to, to think about, but the reality comes in when... We must manage our households well. And that's not to say that our kids are not going to act up because they are sinful creatures, but we give them grace when they do, but we manage them well. We teach them the word of God. We raise them to be godly kids. We raise our wives to be godly wives. We must manage our household well. The next is that he must not... uh, 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 he must not be a recent convert. Or this, 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 this word here might be more of a novice uh, or one who is newly planted uh, is, the, is the Greek word. And so uh, this was referring to a young Christian. Uh, age is no guarantee for maturity, by the way. Uh, I have been I have been serving in ministry since I was 18 years old, and uh, this is I, even at 18 I was considered young. At 20 at 21 I pastored my first church, uh, and I know you're imagining right now a 21 year old pastoring a church. I did a terrible job, uh, but that wasn't because of my age. That was because of my maturity. Uh, it is good for a man to give himself time to know what he believes before he tries to teach others what he believes. He must not be a recent convert. That does not mean that you cannot allow recent converts to serve in the church, but he should not take the office of a pastor. Um, He should not take the office of a pastor. And I'm going to use my platform for a moment and tell you, if you're watching this, if you're a search committee, if you're any kind of thing, The idea that your pastor has to be 30 before he can be a pastor is crazy. Uh, And honestly, if I'm being honest, that was detrimental to my ministry. uh, Was that this idea that a pastor had to be 30 before he could be a pastor. Uh, I'm off my soapbox. The next is he must have good standing without the church. He must have a good testimony outside of the church. Pastor, do you pay your bills on time? Do you have a good reputation in the community? And again, we talk about this. Those of you that will be in the long term of ministry, you will travel a lot. You will go around and you will begin be in new communities. You will be in places that you've never been before. And you will have to build this, this testimony up. But do you have a good testimony? You see, no pastor feels that he has done all that he can. No pastor has ever come home and felt like he's done everything. There's always more to do. There's always one more person to see. There's always one more thing to do. Manage your household well, but manage your community engagement well too. Be involved. Try to get involved with the sports teams. Be involved in the schools. Be seen in the community. And I know that kind of goes against what we talk about is, you know, be, uh, do things with your left hand so your right hand. Sometimes you have to be seen doing God's work so that people will know that you're godly. It doesn't mean you boast about it, but you do it, not expecting any kind of recollection or, or recognition out of it. As we wrap up, I want to encourage you, pastor, these qualifications are things that you must abide by in your life. Live them, know them, live by them because they are detrimental to your ministry when you don't. Uh, These qualifications are absolute uh, and they need to be abided by. Next week, we're going to talk about the deacons and how our deacons should uh, ordain themselves, be, uh, or commit them, or, uh, organize themselves and and, uh, uphold themselves. Ordain wasn't the right word. They are called just as pastors are. There is a calling on their lives. But I want to encourage you, pastor, with one final thing. You'll find yourself going back to the beginning of this chapter to remind yourself that it is a noble task that God has called you to. Because God has called you to a great 
and wonderful and difficult task. But if he has called you to it, he will provide for you through it. He will provide for you as you go through this ministry. I hope you have a fantastic week and we will see you all next week.